Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to a new week of study, study number 111 on Daniel's last vision. And we have some interesting things to look at before we go back to Daniel, just uh, addressing some loose threads that uh, have been brought to my attention. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for each person who comes to these studies, who watches them, who contemplates your word, who's seeking for truth. And we're thankful for the time that we have together and sharing and studying and being corrected. And we just pray, Lord, for your spirit to be here now to correct us, but to give us wisdom. Um, we pray uh, for this movement. We pray for our friends and families and those that we have contact with. We know, Lord, that you are laying a foundation that you are building um, in order for this final work to be accomplished upon this earth. And we just ask that we can play the part that you have given us to play faithfully. We pray for your angels' care and protection for our families. And um, we ask, Lord, that you can be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again, everyone. So I guess the discussion came up uh, yesterday that, that William was a part of, which is, and he kind of shared it with me. So I thought it was, it was rather interesting. Um, so Brian had brought up some numbers uh, relating to the camp meeting that we had at Telford Muse uh, this last summer. And, and also was discussing this 68, 2688. So this was a number that, uh, that we counted from November 24th, 2022. So actually I should show you the diagram first. This is, now this is Judges 5 verse 14 to 31. Now the reason why Judges 5 verse 14 to 31 is a separate line is that when we looked at the song of Deborah and Barak, because remember, this goes all the way back, uh, this, this book of Judges, um, in how we were making application to our time, but it related to our lines. And this is going to relate to Parminder and Tess, their message, and um, the judges that symbolize the response to that message. So there's lots in here. I'm not going to look at all the details. What I want you to look at is... Um, here at the end, you can see there's a close of probation, January 11, 2023. That's Collins' prediction regarding Trump. And then we have uh, the fourth angel arriving. So we, we put here, like, close of probation. I mean, we could have put other symbols there, Sunday law and stuff, that all represent the close of probation. And um, I'll make it a little bit bigger. All right, so... So we got this, these verses. And so these verses were then written out. And, and we had two different ways in which we interpret this. We had one, uh, which is this one. And you can see that both of these have the 2,688 days, which is 168 times 16, going to April 5th, 2030. Now we know April 5th, 2030 is not, we're not predicting anything on that day. Right. It's a symbolic date. It ties to our history. It's 2300 lunar months from the first day of the first month in 1844. And it's the first day of the first month, also on the 187th year later. So it has the symbol of from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. But it also is the first day of the first month in 2030. So um, so it's going to be this. Uh, 67,320 days, and that's just 2,300 times 29.530587, right? So if you take a lunar month and you multiply it by 2,300, you get 67,320. That's the number of days from the first day of the first month, okay? And there's other ways in which we established April 5th, 2030. But as we were dealing with Collins' prediction, um, we ended up with this... Uh, November 24th date. I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but one of the things is it's going to be 589 days from July 18, 2020. And uh, 589 is, if you take 1,533, that's going to be, I think it's the octal or something. 859, pardon me. I just said it backwards. Now, there's 1,533 days from October 13th, 2018 
December 4th, 2022. And then from July 18, you get this November 4th, 2020. So 859 days. So that relates to this number. These numbers are related to each other. And there was a bunch of other things. We looked at at the Hebrew number Tanakh, which we took away the zero. We just looked at, at the 859 there. So you can see that that number relates to this. And that's in this story where they're going to talk about uh, Tanakh, right? Now, we also had another line. So this is basically the same line, except that in this one, we put the camp meeting invitation and the camp meeting uh, connected to, to this. We still have the April 5th, 2030. So you can see this is just another way of looking at this line. And, and so this is kind of the line that, that we, we ended up with, I think, is the primary line looking at the camp meeting. So when we had gone over it the, the second time, we ended up with this line. So when we look at this, these verses here, so I know this is, you know, this isn't Daniel uh, chapter 11, but it, it's relating to the symbolic use of these numbers. So when we go to uh, Judges 8, I can't remember which verse it is. It's going to be in here somewhere. Uh, it's going to talk about Tanakh. So it's going to be, so i got to go back here. Let's play a, this isn't the right place. Pardon me, it's not eight, it's five. There we go. <laughs> um, went to the wrong place. So yeah, none of that looked right. So they're going to have this, this battle. It's going to be sung about here. It's going to be in, I'll do it this way. So Tanakh, and that's going to show up in which verse? I can't see it. Oh, the waters of Megiddo is going to be by the waters of Megiddo. Yeah, so it's going to be Judges 519, right right here. It's this. They took, um, so it says, uh, the kings came, fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of, of money, right? So this word Tanakh, when we looked at it, we can see that it's going to occur in Joshua 12, 21, 12 times 21 is 25, 20. It's going to be in Joshua 17, 11. 17 times 11 is 187. Judges 127. So that's going to be July 21st backwards. And then we also see it in Joshua 21, 25. And the 21, 25, if you multiply those together, you're going to get... Uh, 525. So you have the 252, the 525, and July 18th. Plus you have the symbol for midnight. But the three that are in Joshua give you that 777 structure, right? So when we had gone through this, we could see how this all related to our lines. So going back to this uh, diagram here, we then have this 2,688 days when we looked that up. We found that it was uh, in the American tax system. It's it's um, number. It, I can't remember what you call it, but it's um, like a file number for when you make an application uh, for an additional extension of time to pay your taxes. So that's number two six eight eight. And so we applied that symbolically uh, to this movement. And we found if we counted from this November twenty fourth, twenty twenty date, that it was. 2,688 days to April 5th, 2030, which we already had. And we noticed it's also 168 times 16. So 168, the number of hours in a week. So it's basically 7 times 16 times um, 24, right? That's, you would get that number. And then we have these camp meeting invitations. So not going to go into all the detail about this, but I want to look at this number, uh, 2688. Now, we may have looked at this um, before, application for an additional time to file income taxes is what do I put. I, I think it's actually, the one I said, application for an additional extension of time is how they worded it. But anyway, so we got two, six. So when we look up this Hebrew number, 2688, um, we're going to see that uh, it, it's going to give up, and an, it'll make more sense once we actually Look at this. Um, but this word, Hazon Tamor, 
it means a division of the palm tree, right? Or dividing the date palm. Now, we know that the city of palm trees is Jericho, which represents the rebuilding of Jericho, which is a rejection of the 2520. And the dividing of the date palm would relate to the 2520. That is, there is division here, right? If you look at Strong's, it will say something similar. So that was Brown and Driver Spriggs. A division, that is perhaps row of the palm tree, right? So it's like a row or a division of the palm tree. And you can see it's taken from chatzatz, which means uh, to chop, pierce, or sever, and from tamar, which means to be erect, which is like a palm tree, okay? And then we can also look at the Greek number. So the Greek number uh, means demeanor or behavior, right? So it's neither good nor bad in behavior. It's just uh, katsima means behavior, demeanor, properly a position or condition. Okay. Now, the thing that's interesting is it comes from 25, 25 in the Greek. And, and you can see the 252 and the 525 in there. You should be able to see that quite clearly. So you can go 252 and 525 are in that number. So it relates to just our, our lines, just like we looked at there in the book of Judges. Now, what was brought up? yesterday by Brian had to do with the Telford camp meeting. Now he had done a simple calculation and I'll just do it here for you. And he just took the date of the camp meeting. So the camp meeting begins and, and the date that he's going to use is July 30th. No. Nope. So that's going to be um, the last day of the camp meeting. If I remember correctly. All right. He's also going to use the seven. Yeah, um, July 24, and do the same thing with it. Okay, so anyway, when we multiply it, we get this number 4830. Now, we could see that that would relate to a Hebrew number. So now the first thing, what he did is he, he didn't look at it with the zero. He just took the zero off. So when he first looked at it, when he looked at it, he presented this to William here. Um, he's going to uh, look at the Greek and the Hebrew. So it's 483 in the Greek, and you're going to get, um, and this is what he tried to focus upon. I don't know why that happens. Um, a, to dispute or refuse. Now, we actually made an invitation to the, the, the Canadian group and the American group. I invited Daniel Fontenot as a speaker, uh, Joanne as a speaker, Colin as a speaker, and, and also Jeff, right? So they were all invited. Now, they refused. And, and you can see this idea of contradict, deny, gain, say, speak against, right? So he looked at this. <laughs> now, if you add the zero, you get co-participant. So were they invited to partake of this camp meeting? According to our line, and we'd have to say yes, but they refused. So if he had looked at, at, at the zero and looked at it, you can see that this is actually speaking against what he's trying to portray by these numbers. Now, if I look at the Hebrew number, so the one he's going to look at, I'll look at uh, first without the zero. He looks at the word speechless or dumb or dumb man, right? So if you look at Brown Drivers Briggs, it's going to give you a bit more information on that. And the idea is that it's mute, silent, dumb, unable to speak. So they chose not to speak about, like they didn't attend the camp meeting, so they refused, but they also chose not to speak, right? They were mute, some dialect, silent and dumb. So that was a choice that they made. Now, if we add the zero to this, um, you're going to see you're going to get pasturing, pasturage, shepherding, um, you know, and it can refer, refer to the flock as well. Um, so you refer to the pasture, you can refer to the flock. That's what metonymy means. Um, that just by relation. So, so the idea here is that we offered them an opportunity to all meet together, to study together, to feed, right? Because it comes from the word of a sense of feeding, right? And they refused, they were mute, 
And that was their demeanor, right? That was their behavior that actually is being spoken against. I hope I'm not being too harsh here, but when we, when we look at this, how we use numbers, and this is really the point that I want to bring out, is that we need something that's solid so that we're not just coming up with whatever interpretation we want. And what did we do to establish our interpretation, our application of the camp meeting and April 5th and all these different dates? What did we use? What What is our basis? Isn't it the narrative of scripture? Yes. And we always accept what the Bible plainly says. No way can we use numbers to create something. Everything that we do always comes from a direct application of the scriptures, first in its historic application. And if there is a parallel application, it's going to be evident from all of the symbols plainly in scripture, plus also the story itself. And and so we have seen that when we went through Judges, it was a really strong testimony of the symbolic use of numbers in application to this movement, to our lines, to the dates that were happening and what was happening in the movement. And, and you can see this here. It's it's quite clear. Okay. Now, now you said, uh, William, that he used another number, so he's going to use uh, the date the camp meeting starts. That's correct. And what does what he do with that? Let me get my notes. Let's see. So, so it starts on the 24th. Time yeah, seven. He, it, it starts on the 24th. He did the same. He said seven times 24 times 23. And I didn't get the number for that. The so sometimes, of course, is going to be 168, right? right. right. And then you multiply that by 23. Right. He also used 6 times 14 times 46, which is Jeff's um, birthday. And he came up with that um, 83864. Okay, Jeff's birthday is what? It's 6... 1446. Okay, yeah, that's not Jeff's birthday. That's uh, Trump's. Oh, yeah, Trump's. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Okay, so 3864. So what did he do with this number? He just looked up the Hebrew numbers? Yeah, just looked at the Hebrew numbers because that, that's the one that he used for the 2520. To calculate the 2520. Okay, so we go 3864. Yeah, that's the one he used to calculate to um, calculate the twenty five twenty. So empty hearted, afflicted. So that's in Daniel the Libyans. It refers to the Libyans. Right. Uh, okay. And Which that could they could match up with Trump, but <laughs> I reckon yeah. empty hearted. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just not a fan of of interpreting uh, things this way because. He's kind of going backwards. He's trying to, um, yeah, I'm not sure what, what, what his interpretation is here. Well, he took that number and, and, and he, um, what he did was he, um, multiplied it. Or I think he multiplied it with six, one, six, eight. I think I ain't for sure. I think that's what he used it for. Yeah. And then if you use, yeah. So, um, yeah. So this is again, this is just the point meeting we got along the sea. Like I don't, I don't know what he would get from this, to be honest, from the start of this. Yeah, but but the but the, but the camp yeah. meeting, he he went seven times twenty four times twenty three. Yeah, which I did. So that's the number I get three eight six and four. But I don't know what he's interpreting here from that. I mean, maybe there's something. But but anyway, I, I just wanted to take a quick look at that. Well, he used that to say that was Trump. He that it was Trump, but he used that number to get to twenty five twenty, and I didn't get the notes on it. Anyway, yeah. so he's the start of our camp meeting, and then he's going to use Trump's birthday six times fourteen times forty six. Yeah. So I don't which, know. That. Which is also three eight six four. Okay, I see. So if you take Trump's birthday and you take the start of our camp meeting, the two produce the same number. Okay, so that's interesting, right? 
All right. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure how he's interpreting it, how that speaks against us. Uh, well, he I, he used it to calculate the twenty five twenty what he was doing. Yeah, I, I, he he either took he either took one sixty eight and subtracted or multiplied it, and it came out twenty five twenty, which that wouldn't come out twenty five twenty. But I can't remember which number he used to calculate for the twenty five twenty. Stephen, do you have any ideas what he could have been doing three eight six four? How that would relate to the twenty five twenty? I have no idea. So, so the, the, his, his Trump's birthday is is June fourteenth, nineteen um, forty six, right? So yeah. it produces this number three eight six four, and then we also take the start of the camp meeting seven times twenty four times uh, twenty three, and you still get that same number, right? Right. So pretty interesting. Uh, that the start of our camp meeting has these, and the end of our camp meetings has the symbols attached to it, uh, relating to these Hebrew numbers. But he has something to do with the twenty-five twenty here. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't. Um, what it would be? I can't remember which numbers he used to calculate that twenty-five twenty. So no. my brain ain't all together, so I don't know. But he used a twenty-five twenty somehow or another. Uh, with those numbers, I don't know how he could. I mean, there's not any relationship to it. Yeah. Um, okay. It might be different numbers. I might be mistaken on that part, but yeah, it, 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 it does. It does come out. It does come out that at three eight six four, which is Trump's. Right. So, so the thing is, our camp meeting, the start of our camp meeting, the date for that, the fact that it connects to the birthday of Trump with the same Hebrew number. I think is interesting. We'd have to, we'd have to see what that number means more. Um, uh, so I, I don't know at this point. So we, we want to go back to Daniel. So hopefully that a little excursion there was, was, was profitable. So one is, you know, that, that the problem that Brian's going to have if he accepts what Jeff is teaching. Of course, Jeff is saying we can't do any of this with these dates, with these numbers. But there are people in the movement now are just saying, well, we don't want to have to deal with numbers. It's nice that we don't have to anymore, right, in following Jeff. Um, but we still have people like Brian, who, or Brian, as he likes to be called, to deal with, with symbols and numbers and, and Colin as well. You know, I don't, I don't really understand that. To me, it's inconsistent. Either we can use these numbers or not. Either we had light in this movement since 2012 that led up to July 18, 2020, and, and all what we see happening now, or that was all just a deception of Satan. And, and so that's something that people have to decide for themselves. But I, I don't see the logical consistency. If, if you're going to follow Jeff, that you're still going to be using numbers. You pretty much have to just reject numbers if you're going to follow what Jeff is saying. So we're back at Daniel chapter 11. And, uh, of course, we we started moving past this verse 16 into verse 17 and 18. For some reason, that's the file I need to open. So what is it that we are, what is it, so if, can somebody give just a quick summation of what it is we're doing in Daniel 11 right now? What is it we're doing? You know, open up the document. You can look at this here. Because we started on verse um, 16. We're using, oh. hit, we're using the history to bring it to our history. Yeah, okay. So we're making a parallel with our history, and it's it's Rome, pagan Rome now, right? We had Greece using verse 14, 15, 16, that is the end of Greece. And so now we're using 14, 15, 16 as the beginning of Rome, and that's going to mark the beginning of our history. So we started looking at verse 17. So he pagan Rome under Julius Caesar parallels the papacy. So we had started discussing some of these things and we were looking at, you know, all these different events. We looked at uh, the Soviet Afghan war. We looked at uh, the Pope meeting uh, the presidents of the United States. Um, first Carter, so Pope John Paul II, first Carter, and then um 
you know, the different presidents. We could connect George Bush Sr. with George Bush, the inauguration there. So there was all kinds of numerical symbols that we could establish that the interpretation that we have makes sense, that we can go back and look at Rome, the rise of Rome, when Rome exalts itself to establish the vision as the period before November 9th, 1989. And then we're going to get all the symbols that bring us uh, to the beginning of our lives. So we just started looking at some of this history, which I didn't have time to read as much as I wanted to. I know I said I was going to watch some more videos and read some more history because dealing with Cleopatra. So the one thing I do know is that Julius Caesar is going to go to Alexandria and he's going to be there for a long time. Sort of, it's, it's called the Siege of Alexandria. And in that siege, that's where he's going to make this league with Cleopatra, right? Uh, making her his mistress, right? Um, so there's going to be a lot of stuff going on there with Cleopatra. And we know Cleopatra is going to be involved later. There's also the civil war that ended up happening with Pompey, right? And somehow in this, in this history, Julius Caesar is going to end up coming out on top, which really doesn't make much sense. He, he, he stayed away for quite a while. So I think we need to look at that history a little bit more to try to understand it. Um, now, Stephen, you have some ideas about this history because you've been working on it quite a bit. So how would you look at verse 17 here? What What is it that you see that we should be addressing first? Well, my understanding was just what? Basically, Swearingen or Uriah Smith had done a study. They haven't really expanded more on them verses other than what they had said. Well, that's good. So, what did they say? <laughs> um, right, okay. Just give me a second, I'll bring it up. Okay. Because I know there's this civil war from 49 to 45 BC. So, this civil war is going to be basically it's Pompey and, and Julius Caesar. So they got these two factions. You got Gaius Julius Caesar and Gnaeus Pompeius or Pompey Pompeius Magnus, right? So they have the civil war going on. Okay, so I'm trying to see this here. Okay. Yes, yeah, so what I have just now first is uh, that he, Julius Caesar, yeah, uh, also set his face to enter with the strength of his old kingdom. So this has been applied to Caesar's determination and actions that mm -hmm. will eventually lead to Rome subjugating Egypt. Right. And upright ones with him, thus shall he do. So Uriah Smith relates the upright ones to Jews who assisted armies who passed through Judea with the aim of aiding Julius Caesar when he was besieged in Alexandria. Yeah. And he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her. So Caesar takes Cleopatra as his, as a mistress. Mm -hmm. He there, maybe you suggest, I don't know, could be who's who's given Caesar this woman. So uh, as something which I don't think Uriah Smith or anyone has really, uh, as something I didn't really contemplate myself much. Maybe it's uh, some relation to Cleopatra, I'm not sure. But then, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. So that was Cleopatra, was later not a support for Caesar. Okay. Also, right. Okay. So, so that's basically the idea of what, what we, we have here. Now, when he shall give him the daughter of women, we're taking that as not a specific person, but just symbolically that she's given in marriage. Right. Is, is that, would that be a correct way of looking at it? Well, because I don't think they didn't, I don't think they did marry, did they? No, but we're just using it symbolically, right? Because normally you give your daughter to wife, but in this case, she's just becoming a mistress. Does that, does that make sense or not? Right, so yeah, just... But, but would she not already be corrupt anyway? Or to yeah, but, but, but in the sense of, I understand what you're saying. She's already morally corrupt, so... But we're just using this in the sense of that when a woman is normally given, she's going to be a wife. But here she's going to be a mistress. 
And so we're going to make an application to our time what that means. It's just there's no way we can know that he shall give him. Well, who's the he, right? It's, there's no he that I can see uh, in the literal sense that that we could apply here unless there's some other way to interpret this verse. But based on how it's been interpreted by Rye Smith, the he is not really addressed, right, the who, who that would be. So I'm just saying it's just a kind of an expression. She's given to Julius Caesar, but she's well, just going to mistress, would, right? Would, so, yeah. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be um, Pharaoh, one of the um, Pharaohs who give it to give him, wouldn't that be the he? No. No, there's no he in the history, right? That's what I'm trying to say. So in the history, um, there's not a he. So we would have to take this as the idea here is the daughter of woman. And that's the thing is it's the daughter of women. So you know, why would it be the daughter of women? Why wouldn't you just say he shall give him the daughter corrupting her, right? But it's going to be the daughter of women. So to parallel to me here has to go back to, to, to the symbol of marriage. Cause this word, Isha in Hebrew, I mean, that, that's the word for woman, right? Now it can mean lots of different things, but, but you have daughter, uh, bat. So you got this, you know, bath, bat. And, and so, so you have this word as well together. So, and then it, he shall give. Right. So that's that's going to be in the masculine form. The idea is that he is giving. Now, I, I tried to look in the Hebrew here and really understand what was going on. So when I looked at this verse, when we did this last time, it, it it's kind of obscure. So maybe there's something uh, here that we. So the daughter that women, it's in the plural and Natan. So it's got, and it's got a different form of the word natan. So that's like he will give because it's yatan. Then it has not to decay. So the idea is there is a he there in, in the Hebrew. That's basically, I guess, the main thing. So, so that's a correct translation, um, of that verse. Well, yeah. Uh, cause he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, what's uh, that? Uh, um, he says after landing in Egypt, Caesar would learn that Cleopatra had been involved in a dynastic war with her husband and brother. So there, she married her brother. Uh, Ptolemy the twelfth, Theos, fellow Peter. So taking up residence in the royal palace of Alexandria, uh, mm-hmm. he would decree that Cleopatra and Ptolemy should reign jointly. So he's kind of like. Trying to arbitrate, sort of uh, bring them together, and then he mentions about the uh, after bringing about this reconciliation between the king and queen, Caesar would make uh, Cleopatra his mistress as a show of power, taking the daughter of women and corrupting her. So that's his. Okay. Uh, he doesn't say, doesn't say who that he is in any way. Whether it be her husband or anything, or yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you have other people involved here, but the idea. So um, in Young's literal translation, it says, "And he hath wrought, and the daughter of woman he giveth to him to corrupt her, and she doth not stand nor is for him." Now, uh, this idea that he had wrought. When we look at um, thus shall he do now, that's a little bit different. And he hath wrought and the daughter of woman, he giveth to him to corrupt her. So now sometimes that word uh, do. Right. That it's translated. He shall do I'm gonna go over here now to do or to make, to accomplish, advance a point. So it has a it's a very common word. I mean, it's it uh, occurs. 2,633 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. So it's a very, very common word. Um, but thus, but he's, um, but he hears, thus shall he do, or the idea that 
he shall do. So it, the thus I don't think is implied in the Hebrew, right? So it's it's something because it's just a vav, it's just a consecutive vav. So and he hath wrought, or thus shall he do. So thus shall he do. I don't think makes sense, you know, just from the Hebrew itself. So when he hath wrought or has done, so once he has done, and the daughter of woman he giveth to him, is what it says is young, and the daughter of woman he giveth to him to corrupt her. So, I mean, what is the idea that maybe the he could refer to God overseeing this event? Any ideas about that? Or what about even Satan? Well, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. But to, to me, this is almost like this fulfillment of prophecy, that God is the one overseeing all of this. And so even when it says, and he hath wrought, I mean, that he could also refer to God, right? This is where, so so that God is in control of this event is is what I would be saying. Just like when you get to verse 15 or 14, where it says, you know, the sons of the destroyers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. You know, they're obviously not intentionally doing that, but it is in God's control or God's providence. I'm just saying that maybe that's what's being showed here, that God has done this. He has allowed this. He is. He has the one that is given this daughter of woman to corrupt her. Right. As as a fulfillment of prophecy. Does that does that make sense to people, or am I putting something that's not here? This would just show God's hand in it all. Ultimately, God has seen it. Mm -hmm. This prophecy and uh, permitted it. Mm -hmm. He has permissive will in a sense, um, but I'm, I'm maybe I'm a bit hesitant just to to say that it's really into God. Okay, there might be another way to to sort of establish this here. Um, so this word, 6213, I'm just going to look at uh, this word, its use. So you can see it's translated as do. Now I've got to get rid of the Hebrew here. You don't want to see that. So the first time it shows up as the word do is Genesis 16, verse 6. I'm just going to see um, it's used as the word um, made. In Genesis 1, verse 7. So God made the firmament as done. But the Lord said unto the woman, what is it that thou hast done? So we can see it in use of God. We can see it in use of the woman. We can see it here. Uh, Thus did Noah, according to all, so did. It shows up first in Genesis 6, 22. And then, uh, and then make. 126 in Genesis 126, God says, let us make man in our image as the word wrought uh, in Genesis 34, verse 7. The sons of Jacob came out of the field where they heard it and were grieved. And it says, um, which thing ought not to be done. So uh, because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So we can see it in a negative sense of action. Doeth. So that's going to be Genesis 31. 12, offer an exodus, keep committed. It's in Leviticus 18, deal, right? So it's got lots of different ways it's translated. Now, uh, the ones that are interesting here, well, you got Genesis 19, 19 showed. Um, but if we go back to this first one, uh, what does uh, 16, 6 represent as a symbol? So if we used it as uh, letters, it'd be AFF or FFA backwards, right? And then we got this one, of course, one seven. That's going to be creation, uh, seven days. And then we're going to have did, 622. That's a symbol for FFA as well, June 22nd. So, I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, but the idea here is that God is often the one doing things. Now, sometimes it's man doing things. Right. And so if you do it as do or as rot, rot is just another way of saying to something that is made or done or accomplished. Right. And, uh, you know, we can see that this word has all kinds of ways in which, you know, we can look at it to do, fashion, accomplish, make. 
to do work, make, produce, appoint, ordain, right? Now, so even in, in this sense, now there's different uh, ways. This is the call form, which it is in this verse. Um, it's not the NIF all done for, for him. So, uh, so this just means that he wrought. So if we go back to this verse, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 17, right? And so it says, and thus shall he do. But we could take this as, and God had ordained, and he shall give him the daughter of women. So, and the idea of the sentence structure here is it's, it's, it's not as clear as, as you know, looks like in the King James. So when you look at the Hebrew, I'll just show you here what what you look for is in Hebrew, you're going to see these, they just show this as a line. You see this, if you can see that. This is the word rot, ein shin he, reading from right to left. And in front of it is just this line. That's a vav. And that just means and, right? So when you see a vav, and he shall rot, and the daughter of woman uh, shall he give to corrupt her, right? And uh, not uh, shall she stand, and not, you know, to exist is, is what it literally says. But, you know, so, so you, you, you understand what I'm saying here. So, there is no reason that you would say that this this here is part of this sentence, right? Because once you have a vav, it's a new clause, right? So to attach this that, uh, and thus shall he rot, sh- thus shall he do, to attach it to what happened before, there's no reason to. It could just say, and God has ordained that this is going to happen, that the daughter of that he shall give the daughter of women, right? So God has ordained that he should give the daughter of woman to him, to to her corruption, to corrupt her. I mean, that would be an argument for that interpretation. I don't know if it makes a great deal of difference as far as how we are going to make an application to our time. But the main thing that I would see is that that this, this woman is being given here, Cleopatra, to uh, to Julius Caesar, right? And normally when you're going to give a daughter of women, that would be in marriage. But in this case, it's going to be in her corruption, right? Making her his mistress. And if we're going to make an application to our time, we would have to see how that plays out in where we're going to place this and what event this would be in our history. Is, is that helpful? Any thoughts on that? My thoughts are that uh, it's applying the he here is applying to Ptolemy. So he's been Caesar's reconciled things and and maybe as a favor, Ptolemy said, "Look, have my wife." It's, he doesn't really. That's, a, that's what comes to my mind. Mm, okay, that that I mean that's possible too, right? So. But does that really directly happen? Is that how you understand that that that's happened? Happens? Well, I've no real substantial evidence for that. I'm just going by what Swearingen saying that uh, Caesar's been an arbiter, arbiter of this year dynastic war and uh, reconcile things. So he has uh, done something which. To be seen as favourable. He's been put into that position that uh, they allowed him, they exalted him to that position in Egypt and that role. And maybe, is there any payment for Caesar for doing that? Okay. So I just think that would maybe. Yeah. It's, I mean, when I, when I look at the history, it's kind of confusing exactly. I mean, she's obviously Egyptian, right? She's born in 69 BC to the ruling Ptolemaic pharaoh Ptolemy the Twelfth. Uh, she has an uncertain mo- mother, presumably Ptolemy the Twelfth's wife, Cleopatra the Fifth Tryphena, who may have been the same per- person as Cleopatra the Sixth Tryphena, the mother of Cleopatra's older sister Berenice the Fourth, 
Epiphania. So you got all these people with these similar names. So it becomes a little bit. So she married her brother Ptolemy the Fourteenth, right? So he is the husband. So it looks as if Swearinger is wrong in that, because he's saying her husband's Ptolemy the Twelfth. So he's maybe got mixed up. Maybe, yeah. I mean, it's easy to get mixed up. <laughs> um, yeah, because they're saying here that uh, you know this is Wikipedia. So that Ptolemy the Twelfth is actually the father of Cleopatra. So she's born in sixty nine. So in you know in the forties, she's going to be in her twenties. Well, sixty nine, right? So by so she's going to be twenty years old in forty nine BC when the civil war is going on. So she's just going to be in her early twenties, and that's Cleopatra the seventh. Uh, I wish these people had a bit more imagination when it comes to naming their kids. So yeah, I'm not really sure how to look at that um, that that idea, but we'll see as we try to apply this to our history, right? So when we when we apply this to what we're doing, um, we just we can understand these things as symbols. So when we go back to this paper here, we look at verse 17. So we're saying in our application that this has to do with the work of papacy because Rome is representing the papacy that is pagan Rome is representing the papacy in our application to put this on our lines now they're going to set his face to enter Egypt and and we have Egypt here that should be in black because that was the historical application which we're saying is atheistic communism under the UN right so so the question is the papacy doing that? And does it do that in that history? And one of the things we get with 9-11 and, and with 1989 is we see that the papacy is conquering the United States, but it's also seeking to conquer uh, Egypt. So it's going to do that. Technically, first, it, it overthrows the Soviet Union. But the UN, what role is the UN have? And what's the relationship between the papacy and the UN? Right. Because we know we got the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. And, it, and it's through the United States primarily that we see. So when we look at the U.N. and the papacy, what is the papacy doing in this history? Talk a little bit about it. Now, we know that that the Vatican is not part of the United Nations. It's just an observer. Right. And it got this observer status on the 6th of April, 1964. So how is the U.N. and the papacy connected? Okay, so one thing we can say, in 1919, there's a conference at the League of Nations, and a motion was proposed to encourage international cooperation with the Holy See, as they call it. Uh, the motion, encouraged by delegations in Belgium and Switzerland, was adopted by a majority of participants, although it met resistance from the United Kingdom and Italy. Reports indicated that the Holy See regretted its exclusion and wished to be admitted to the League of Nations. In 1923, however, the Holy See took a different position and stated that its only competency was in matters of elucidation of questions of principle and morality and public international law. In 1924, the Holy See received an invitation from the British delegate to become a member of the League, but this proposition received no official reaction from other member states. So, um, and when it became clear that the ongoing territorial dispute with Italy resolved with the 1929's Lateran Treaty, precluded it from joining the League. So, um, so this is the League of Nations, which is the precursor to the UN. So, so it's not officially part of the UN, right? It's a permanent observer state, right? April 6, 1964. Any thoughts about what's happening in this verse? How the papacy sets his face to enter Egypt. And, and here it's not the USSR. It's after the fall of the Soviet Union. That's atheistic communism. So what would we do with this? Is this time uh, in uh, 1989, 1990? Yeah. I think uh, we can see certain nations uh, which... Uh, 
were aligned with uh, the Soviet Union. We, we see that uh, democracy is coming in these countries because a lot of countries like here in Africa, they are one party state. And uh, we find that uh, from that period of time, we find that these nations now, there is a um, multipartism which is uh, being established. Okay. And any more thoughts on, on how we can, because if we're dealing with the UN, atheistic communism, because it's going to come with the strength of his whole kingdom. Now, normally when we look at this, we're looking at, we would think normally of military force. So this is authority, power, strength, energy so this right so so if we're looking at this this is more about authority right so it's not about military might so how is the papacy using its authority what authority does the papacy actually have well right now she don't have hardly any well no the papacy has lots of authority okay there's lots I mean, what does it what does it control? Uh, church. Yeah, it, it's 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 religious authority, right? It doesn't have a lot of uh, political authority or military might, but it definitely has lots of religious authority. Well, you have uh, sort of military orders within the Roman Catholic Church. You know, the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of Malta, and so forth. Yeah, and they yeah, I, they are I high play- Hockey for a Knights of Columbus team. And but, you have, uh, uh, yeah, and you have economic might as well connected with a lot of them. Yeah, so they have, they have economic power and they have you know military. But if we talk about you know they uh, with the strength of their whole kingdom, that's going to be all of the different orders, all of the different things that the Catholic Church is doing, right? Now, like I played on a hockey team, Knights of Columbus, I was by invitation, and I didn't know what the Knights of Columbus are. All I know is it was Catholic because, uh, you know, they would all uh, do the sign of the cross before they started a game, which, of course, I didn't do. But, um, you know, they have all of these different organizations. So these organizations, what is it that the papacy is seeking to accomplish against atheistic communism or the UN, what is it? Because they're going to enter, right? Infiltration. Ah, there you go. Infiltration. Okay. Right? So so this is about infiltration, right? So this is not conquering. This is infiltrating. So all of these different forces, these different powers of the Catholic Church, of the papacy, are meant to infiltrate, right? In, instead of doing it directly, right, becoming a member of the UN and having votes, they influence through their different organizations with the strength of their whole kingdom to conquer Egypt, the UN. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So, so this is the infiltration that we see of not just the Jesuits, but even these other little minor things, you know, like the Knights of Columbus, you know, it's just to me, it was just a hockey team. You know, uh, it was through St. Francis, uh, the school that was a block from my house. Right. So. Um, but yet they're infiltrating society right through these different types of organizations. They're pushing the Catholic agenda in in all different kinds of ways. Right. So that's the strength. That's the authority that they have. Right. Their kingdom is a religious kingdom primarily. Now, of course, you know, historically, this is Rome, which is a military power. But if we apply it to our history, we can see that that this is is this religious power, the papacy. Pagan Rome is typifying the papacy, papal Rome. Now, then it says, and upright ones with him, right? So we're going to see the Jewish forces are going to be loyal to Caesar, led by Antipater. But in our history, who is then uh, being infiltrated? Who are the upright ones that we would uh, be speaking of here? Would it be the Protestants? Okay. So the upright ones here, I'm just going to put that this is the Jews. 
you know, in the application originally, which is going to equal, does that make any sense to people? Anybody not like that? Does anybody like it? Can we say this represents the Seventh-day Adventist Church? That's what came to my mind. Yeah. Now, one thing that we can do with this is when we deal with spiritual formation, so when we have these season makes sense, I'm not sure, SDA, okay. I thought that was just a typo. Okay, so so the Jews represent the Seventh-day Adventists. With him, that is the Jewish force forces loyal to Caesar, led by Antipater. So here, now, what does Antipater mean? And the father. Yeah. So I'm going to put Protestants in spiritual formation here. So has the Seventh-day Adventist Church adjoined the papacy through the Protestant churches through spiritual formation in September of 2001? So this, I mean, it makes sense. I'm just throwing it out there, right? But we can see that antipatter means against the father. That would be Protestants. They're opposed to the papacy. So antipatter would just be another way of saying Protestant. They're, they're protesting against the Catholic Church. But they have been deceived with this spiritual formation. Because spiritual formation is simply idol worship, and it's connected to uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. We'll call him St. Ignatius, but, you know, Ignatius of Loyola. Who... Um, and what does he bring that's connected with spiritual formation? It's these spiritual exercises, right? Isn't that what spiritual formation is? Just another Jesuit uh, type of mysticism? Am I wrong there? Yes. No. I'm wrong? No, I agree with you. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I said, am I wrong? And you said yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> So, so I would think that that would show how the papacy is operating in this history prior to September 11th, but also especially when we look at September 11th, we know that the United States is conquered, and that's going to be through partly spiritual formation, but other things, the, the law, right? What happens with... Um, the Patriot Act, that's part of this connection. So, but we also see the spiritual formation part of things, right? So that's a religious idea that has infected the Protestants because they've fallen. They've, they become daughters of, of the papacy. So we're going to see here, um, it says, thus shall he do. So we've discussed this a little bit, but I don't know if I like that begin the Roman subjugation of Egypt, because I still don't think that this this connects to um, like in the historical application. Uh, this just to me, this illustrates God's providence. But I'll I'll leave it there for now. And then he shall give him the daughter of women. So we have Cleopatra. So that's literally what's there. So can we see a connection? with what's happening in this idea of the Seventh-day Adventists, the Protestants, spiritual formation, um, and and then this daughter of women. So what's a daughter of women? Well, I think of the Protestants, the daughters of the war, Revelation 17. Yeah, now, and now it's also woman, it, it, Ishaim, right? So it's it's plural. It's actually going to be Hanashim, so that's the plural form, the regular plural. And, and literally, it's and daughters, daughter, the women, daughter of the women, right? Of is not usually expressed in Hebrew. So the daughter of the women. So and what did you say again, Stephen? How did you word that? Well, you have in Revelation 17, the whore and then her daughters. Right. Yeah. So you have the Revelation 17, the woman, the whore, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth, right? And her daughters, right? So we see that the daughters here um, would refer to the Protestant churches as well. But so the way that I would look at this, so the way that I would try to understand this passage in its historical sense, because <clears throat> I'm going to say, you know, 
uh, I'm going to I'm going to translate this differently. I'm going to say, "Thus shall he do" would be because I'm I'm going to go with my interpretation of this here. Yeah, I looked a wee bit more into the history there. Yeah. Cleopatra. And uh, Caesar gave her marriage to, I think it was her younger brother. I think he was a fourteen. Okay, excuse me. So Caesar gave Cleopatra in marriage to um to I think it was her younger brother. Or, um, let me see how I just lost my face here. So this is going back to an, an encyclopedia. Going yeah. back, this is the 1880s. This is so it's quite old. This one, so I don't know. Yeah, um, history's changed since then, but. <laughs> Yeah, I, I understand. So there was um, some issues with uh, this year dynastic war. That was um, so Cleopatra's father died when she was quite young. So Ptolemy the twelfth. And um, I think there was like these here people then in charge who were like uh, guardianships. Um, there's one's called Pontinus and the other one's Achilles. And they deprived Cleopatra of her share of the government in 49 BC. She went to Syria and was forming plans for obtaining her rights by force when Caesar came to Alexandria yeah. and captivated her with her and, and captivated with her youth, youthful charms, second her claims. And though the people of Alexandra were excited to a revolt by the arts of her brother, uh, Caesar succeeded in pacifying them and procured Cleopatra her share of the throne. But Pontinus stirred up a second revolt upon which Alexandrian war commenced, in which Elder Ptolemy, losing his life, uh, so I think I'm not too sure what, what Ptolemy is, just as the elder Ptolemy. Uh, Caesar proclaimed Cleopatra queen of Egypt, but she yeah. was compelled to take her brother, the younger Ptolemy, who was only 11 years old, as her husband and colleague on the throne. Caesar continued some time at Cleopatra's court and had a son by her named Caesarian, who was afterwards put to death by Augustus. So after Caesar's departure, she governed of undisturbed. She subsequently made a journey to Rome, where Caesar received her magnificently and erected a statue, statue to her next to the statue of Venus in the temple, consecrated to that deity. This act, however, excited the displeasure of the people, and Cleopatra soon returned to her own dominions. When her brother at the age of 14 demanded his share in the government, Cleopatra poisoned him and remained the sole possessor of the re regal power. Mm -hmm. So that was that sort of deals with that history. Yeah, so if you were going to do this, so so there's some problems. So when it says, thus shall he do. Okay, so let's, let's just go back, and I'll get rid of what I put in there. Um, we'll discuss it a bit more. So we know that he's going to do, that is he's going to... Um, act in in a particular way so ever the whoever the he is right now we know that um uh in hebrew you know you don't have to have you know somebody mentioned to also just introduce he right and and you don't know which he it's referring to so let's say this is julius caesar so he's he shall give him the daughter of women. Now, of course, the him has not been mentioned yet. So you're, you're saying that we could make this that Julius Caesar is giving uh, the brother of Cleopatra or Cleopatra as a wife. Is that what you're saying? I wasn't saying that. I was just reading what the book was saying. Okay. But I thought okay. about that. It's maybe something mm -hmm. worth it. But we are answering the question of like who, who gave uh, Cleopatra to who? Right. That's kind of the question. And um, so I still like the idea that the he is 
is really that God is overseeing, um, that this is referring to God's providence, and that God gives this daughter of women to, to Julius Caesar. But he's going to corrupt her. Now, she's already corrupt, but we're looking at this from a spiritual point of view of the symbols, right? Because if she's a mistress, she's that's a specific type of corrupting. So there's something here that we, we need to see. How we're going to sort through it, I don't know. But she shall not stand by his side. So we know that that, that she's not going to support him later, right? She's not going to be for him. And this word stand, this is that word stand that we run into all the time. So with here, I just got to look this up again in here because I'm trying to look at what these. Yeah, so the 5975, right? That's the, that's the one it is. So we have the Seventh-day Adventists are going to be united with the papacy through this spiritual formation. And then it says, thus shall he do. So this word, you know, I, I like the, the use of the word point. So the way that I would try to deal with this is that that the he is referring to God. That's uh, another thought. Okay. Um, if you have, thus shall he do, and he shall give. So if you're going to take out as being Caesar, shall give him, and him there is the 11-year-old Ptolemy, the yeah. daughter of woman, corrupting her. But she shall not stand on his so that's young Ptolemy side, neither be for him. So she is going to uh, poison him, kill him. So in a sense, yeah. That's- yeah. So so those those are possible, right? So you know that's what I was saying is when you look at it, you, you can see the possibility. But it, it's not a major part of the story, right? I mean, we can find it in history, but it's just not. It's not. You know, it's not. It's not how. The story is understood because and 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 definitely when we try to make an application to our times, I'm not sure how we could apply that. Right. That's the other thing. You see what I'm saying? Unless you could think of an application, which I can't at the moment. But because we do know that she does not stand on the side. And 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 the thing here that this has to do with um, this conquering that's going on right so this is this is is partly the conquering of egypt but it's it's the conquering of this whole kingdom by julius caesar specifically the kingdom of rome caesar is seeking to um take over rome now okay so when we look at that history um of what's going to happen with the civil war um let me just try so you got Pompey and Julius Caesar in this civil war. That's going to be what from um, so 49 to 45 BC. So I'm going back to that. So there's a buildup of tensions. I'm just going to read some of this here from because this is all that that history. I'm going to read this from Wikipedia, right? So it's called Caesar Civil War. It was a civil war during the late Roman Republic between two factions played by Gaius Julius Caesar and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, Pompey, respectively. The main cause of the war was political tensions relating to Caesar's place in the Republic on his expected return to Rome on the expiration of the governorship in Gaul. Before the war, Caesar had led invasion of Gaul for almost 10 years. Now he's going to get a um, a triumph for that, right? Uh, plus other ones that he didn't deserve. But anyway, a buildup of tension started in late 50 BC with both Caesar and Pompey refusing to back down, led to the outbreak of civil war. Pompey and his allies induced the Senate to demand Caesar give up his provinces and armies in the opening days of 49 BC. Caesar refused and instead marched on Rome. The war was fought in Italy, Italy, Illyria, Greece, Egypt, Africa, and Hispania. The decisive events occurred in Greece in 48 BC. Pompey, Pompey defeated Caesar in the Battle of Dyrrhachium, but the subsequent larger Battle of Pharsalus was won by Caesar, and Pompey's army disintegrated. Many prominent supporters of Pompey, termed Pompeians, 
surrendered after the battle, such as Marcus, Junius, Brutus, Cicero, etc. Um, Pompey fled to Egypt where he was assassinated upon arrival. So there's more background. And I just want to see what Cleopatra has to do with this. So there's the Alexandrian War and Cleopatra. So that's one thing here. Um, okay, when Pompey arrived in Egypt, he was greeted by a welcoming delegation made up of several Egyptians and two Roman officers who had served with him years before. Shortly after boarding their boat, he was murdered in the sight of his wife and friends on the deck. Caesar pursued vigorously as Pompey's skill and client networks made him the largest threat. Uh, he arrived three days after Pompey's murder. There he was presented with the head of Pompey along with the signet ring. Okay. Um, I know that he weeps over this and people disagree on whether it was sincere or not. Okay. So just going to the sie siege of Alexandria. While under siege in Alexandria, Caesar met Cleopatra and became her lover when she secreted herself into the royal quarter. Around this time, Caesar was also also produced his decision on the dynastic dispute. Right, So he's going to settle these wills. I know I need to know this history better. So when we look at this, um, let me go back, back here. So I don't know if that gave us anything really to help us. But when we look at um, this uh this verse as um, understood by Uriah Smith. So when he deals with this, the daughter of a woman corrupt union was Cleopatra, who had been Caesar's mistress, mistress and the mother of his son. His infatuation for the queen kept him much longer in Egypt than his affairs required. He spent whole nights in feasting and carousing with the dissolute queen. But said the prophet, she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. Cleopatra afterward joined herself to Anthony, or Antony, the enemy of Augustus Caesar, and exerted her whole power against Rome. Now, so here, the way that he looks at neither before him, so, so of course, this is after the death of Julius Caesar, you have Augustus, and, and Cleopatra is going to join with Mark Anthony, right? That's, that's the idea. So, I don't know it, what the best way to understand this is. But that's how it was understood. A any thoughts about that? Now, you're saying, I'm just looking at here at swearing and uh, dealing with this. So when we deal with his, um, okay, right? So he is going to say, because you, you re referenced him there. Um, so the Jewish forces in the Roman, yeah. So he doesn't really, doesn't give us enough information here. At least not for me. Okay, so when he deals with, um, okay, I'm going to read Swearingen. We'll look at this. Uh, we're, actually, our time is up. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow. We're going to look at what Swearingen says about these passages. Okay, sorry, I got carried away. Okay, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for your continued help in all that we do. And um, help us as we study on our own uh, to understand these things clearly. Bless each person, we pray and ask in Jesus' name.